Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. Each week at this time brings you a new adventure of The Great Gildersleeve, written by Virginia Safford Lynn. Bertie, are you out here in the kitchen? Did you want something, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, yes, I did. So did I, Unc, but I didn't get to first base. Oh? Well, what was it you wanted, Leroy? Cookies. What do you want? Cake. Uh, no, no. I, I mean, uh, Bertie, I wanted to ask you something. Or rather, I wanted to suggest, or uh, see if you'd mind. Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, if you keep beating around that bush, you'll have all the leaves off it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hesitated because it'd mean extra work for you. But I have to get dinner for all of us anyway. Oh, but this would be fancier than we usually... Bertie, how did you know what I wanted to ask you? Because I was just going to suggest it. What are you two doing, communicating by Ouija board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we must be. Yeah, I was going to ask you to be okay to invite Judge Hooker to dinner. And I was just going to suggest it. How can you invite him when he's clear over in Europe? Oh, you know, he'll be back this week. Uh-oh, doorbell. Will somebody watch my pie? Why? What's it going to do? <laughs> Not going to burn, that's for sure. You know, I'll be kind of glad to see Judge Hooker. <laughs> I really miss the old goat. Oh, sure. He's a swell guy. Yeah, he's real nice. Lots of times. You know, I'm, it might be a good thing for me to go to Europe. It'd be very educational for me. Yeah, almost anything would be very educational for you. <laughs> Telegram, Mr. Gildersleeve. I hope it's not bad news. Yeah, I hope not, too. Thank you, Bertie. <laughs> Judge Hooker landed back in New York this morning. He's flying home. Uh, listen to this. Cher ami. Arriving airport Tuesday, 2.30. Appreciate your fetching me, old top. Eager to relate magnificent European travels. Until then, hasta la vista, pip-pip, and daca <laughs> He didn't leave out a single country. <laughs> you know, he may even come back with a foreign accent. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to hire an interpreter to understand him. <laughs> in just 60 seconds, we'll hear what's going on in Summerfield. But first, hear this. Get the picture. You can now participate in classroom study through telecourses being distributed by USAFI. Films have already been prepared on several different subjects and others are being added. Each course includes from 12 to 20 half-hour films which can be shown on any standard 16 millimeter projector. The telecourses weren't designed to replace regular USAFI high school and college correspondence courses but to be taken in addition to such courses. For example, if you are studying USAFI course 164, beginning Algebra 1, through correspondence, you can get additional instruction by attending 16 one-half-hour filmed lectures on the same subject. These lectures are conducted exactly as though the students were actually in the classroom. Why don't you take advantage of this opportunity to further your education while serving in the armed forces? See your education officer for details, then enroll with USAFI and let a telecourse be your guide. I'll get it. Hello, oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Peavy. What can I do for you today? Feed me. Oh, no, Peavy, let's not get greedy. Well, you invited me to dinner with Judge Hooker, didn't you? Well, yes. Okay, but... then feed me. Oh. oh, good evening, Mr. Peavy. Good evening, Bertie. Hi, Mr. Peavy. Oh, hello, Leroy. How are you tonight? Same as every night. Oh, that's too bad, but we'll make the best of it. <laughs> Bertie, I've been saving up for this treat all day. Well, Bertie won't disappoint you. Well, I really had to stir myself tonight. The judge is a mighty good cook himself, and, well, besides, I had to compete with all those fancy dishes he's been having in foreign countries that I decided the kind of meal he'd most enjoy would be a regular American dinner. After you've had nothing but cake, homemade bread tastes mighty fine. It does? What special stuff are we having tonight, Bertie? Hamburger? No, Leroy, we're having something a little dressier. 
Now, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I'll go out to the kitchen and keep an eye on my dinner. Why do cooks keep watching their cooking all the time? Hey, remember, Bertie, I'm not company, you know. Well, then what are you? You know, I've often wondered. <laughs> <laughs> and that reminds me of something else I've been wondering. What about your being elected president of the Chamber of Commerce? Oh, that's right. Judge Hooker doesn't know what happened while he was gone. Well, I'll bet the old judge would be as pleased as if it had happened to him. He'll... Uh-oh. Exactly. Hmm. You took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, I hadn't remembered that part. <laughs> You'd better. What are you talking about? You lost me after the first uh-oh. Well, I'd forgotten that Judge Hooker thought they were going to elect him president of the CFC. What does CFC stand for? Well, a lot, since they've elected your uncle president. <laughs> yeah. Leroy, CFC stands for Chamber of Commerce. Or cheater of close friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did not cheat a close friend. I had nothing to do with their electing me president. You mean they did it against your will? I, well, <laughs> no. But I mean, the whole point is that I couldn't help it. They were just determined to have me, that's all. You were irresistible? He was the immovable object. He... <laughs> <laughs> Gee, why are you talking like this? Well, I'm talking the way Judge Hooker will when he finds out. Yeah, but he can't blame me. You want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess you got something there. Yeah, now, listen, we'll all just have to be careful not to mention it. But Unky's bound to find out sometime. Yeah, I know, but by that time, maybe I can think of something to... Well, think of something. And you didn't tell him on the way home from the airport? You know, I didn't meet him at the airport. His secretary, Miss Matterhorn, called me and asked if she could go to meet his plane. <laughs> I guess she couldn't wait to see it. <laughs> she always was a very peculiar woman. <laughs> <laughs> But, Unc, if you didn't see him at the airport, how did you invite him to dinner? Hey, my boy, this may come as a big shock to you, but there's a new invention on the market now called the telephone. Gee, I don't seem to be at my best today. Yes. <laughs> oh, there he is now. Now, remember, don't anybody make any slips about the Chamber of Commerce. No, we'll be careful, Unc. Yeah, mom's the word. Well, Horace, you old goat. Bonjour, pip-pip, and come star. And enchiladas to you, too. How are you, Gelde? You old horse thief? Why, George, it's really good to see you. Yeah, let me have your coat. You're looking fine, too, Gelde. And there's more of you. <laughs> Wait a second. I forgot. My taxi's still out there. Hi, Judge Hooker. Welcome home. Well, well, Peavy, how are you? Hi, Judge Hooker. Leroy, mon petit. Is that Judge Hooker out here? Well, Bertie, how good to see you. And it's mighty nice having you back, Judge. Thank you, Bertie. But I'm forgetting about my cab outside. I didn't have any small change to tip the driver, although goodness knows he doesn't deserve a penny. He nearly scared the daylights out of me. Oh, uh, Gilde, could you let me have a few francs? Well, now I feel Judge Hooker has officially come home. <laughs> Here you are, Horace. Thank you. Holy cats! 75 cents? My whole week's allowance. You're in the wrong business, Leroy. <laughs> Thanks very much, Gilde. Leroy, will you run out and give this pourboire to the garçon? Oh, I don't know about that, but I'll run out with a tip for the driver. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leroy. Believe me, the fellow doesn't deserve even his fare. Wholly incompetent. Yeah, well, uh, shall we go into the living room till dinner? Oh, that reminds me. I'd better get back to the kitchen or there won't be any dinner. I know it'll be fine, Bertie. You know, Gilde, it was a real shock to me when I got back to America and saw the difference between the service here and in Europe. Yes, but it must have been great to get back. Great? Why, the service over here is scandalous. Everybody's too hurry, too slapdash, too crude. On the boat coming over here, the service was magnifique. But the moment I arrived, no service, absolutely none. In Europe, everyone is just waiting to serve you. Yeah, is it you or the Yankee Dollar? <laughs> I took care of the taxi driver, Judge Hooker. Danke schön, Pupchen. Oh, my gracious. <laughs> Gildy, may I use your phone? I want to check on my luggage. You know, I traveled all over Europe and didn't lose so much as a single sock. And since I've been back in this country, I seem to have lost everything. Gee, were there presents in it for us? Presents? That's an American word he doesn't understand. <laughs> as a matter of fact, Gildy, I did bring you something. A miniature replica of the ancient Colosseum of Rome. I thought you two had so much in common. Yeah? So much in common? 
Yeah, you're both so big, so round, and so fully cracked. <laughs> <laughs> you old goat. Gildy. Well, I'll be right back from a phone call. Yeah, we want to hear all about Europe. Yeah, something tells me we're going to, too. Hello. I say, are you there? Oh, please, boys. Say, the judge is real gone, isn't he? Yeah, if you ask me, he wasn't gone far enough and didn't stay long enough. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the great Gildersleeve. All of us at some time are faced with a challenge, and the man in uniform is no exception. Before 1870, the forecasting of weather conditions was an unknown factor to the people of the United States, and a serious problem. Commerce along our rivers, for example, were threatened by storms, and many ships were lost in sudden and unexpected squalls. Building was hindered. Homes and lives were lost in tornadoes because there was no way of warning people of the approaching danger. And farmers, having no way of knowing what weather conditions they faced, planted their crops and prayed they would survive any changes in weather. In 1870, however, the United States Army decided to find a solution to this problem and established a weather service with about 20 weather stations throughout the country. At first, some errors were made. And there were many people who doubted the accuracy and dependability of the Army's weather service. But gradually, the accuracy of the forecasts improved. By 1890, the number of Army weather stations increased to 500, and requests for additional stations poured in from all parts of the country. Farmers planted their crops with assurance. Riverboat captains arranged their shipping schedules according to the forecasts. And overland travelers knew what weather conditions to expect. And in that year of 1890, Thanks to the effective work of the Army's Weather Service, Congress established a National Weather Bureau. Once more, the military had successfully met a challenge. Gentlemen, be seated. Soup's on. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, let's eat. Thanks, Bertie. Uh, come on, sit down, everybody. Yes, well, where's Judge Hooker? He's still yakking on the phone. Why doesn't somebody light up that punk? <laughs> Horace, dinner served. Now, remember now, everybody, don't make any breaks about the Chamber of Commerce electing me president. Not a word. Sorry to keep you waiting, but the incompetence you have here in this country is outrageous. Where do I go? For two cents, I'd tell him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sit right there, Judge. Thank you, Gilday. I haven't had one meal fit to eat since I got back here in this country. Well, that's the way the roast beefs. Leroy, <laughs> eat your soup. I'm eating mine, and it's very good, Bertie. Thank you, Mr. Peavy. Ah, the delicious soups of Europe. Italy's minestrone. France's petite mamite. Oh, of course. Well... The black eyed peas in this soup haven't started crying yet. <laughs> Gee, it would sure help my schoolwork if I could take a trip to Europe. In history, the geography, and languages, they, then I'd know what they're trying to teach me. That I doubt. You know, Gildy, it would be very educational for Leroy to take a trip to Europe. For instance, he could see one of the highest mountains, Mont Blanc. Yeah, well, you don't have to go that far. Up in Alaska, we've got Mount McKinley, the highest peak in the North American continent. It'll do until something higher turns up. Oh, Bertie, the fish looks wonderful. Thank you very much. After you've tasted the fish in Europe, oh, that Scotch salmon and Sherberg's soul grilled in mushroom sauce. Well, this is just a plain old catfish that's been yowling around the Mississippi. <laughs> and it's extremely good, too, Bertie. Oh, Thank you again, Mr. Peavy. You know, I think it'd sure be swell to see all the old ruins. You take a good look at Judge Hooker. <laughs> Gilday. Uh, uh, oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, would you pass around the corn corn for me, please? Yeah, of course, Bertie. Uh, here, Judge. You help yourself. Ah, the bread in Europe. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> the Italian bonnet tostade. The French brioche. English crumpets. Hmm. Well, while you go on that cook's tour, this cook will tour back to the kitchen. <laughs> you know, Gildy, you've never lived until you've tasted the fowl on the continent. Yeah, I think the whole place sounds pretty foul. <laughs> <laughs> 
In France, coke on pan, and duck a la orange. On the continent, they use wine so much in their cooking. Oh, those foreign wines are incomparable. Nothing like them. Except California wines. You dare to compare California wines with imported wines? Y Horace, don't forget some of our winemakers were once imported, too. Magnum per magnum, I'll stack our California wines against any of your imports. Well, this is news to me. Well, then it's high time somebody told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind it. Yeah, now Bertie's bringing in the pièce de résistance. Yes, sir, coming right up. Ah, the entree. That reminds me. Have you ever tasted sauerbraten in Germany? Yeah, not this week. <laughs> and, of course, in Belgium, their lapin en vin blanc. That's rabbit in white wine. Yeah? Stewed Belgian hair? <laughs> <laughs> and over in France, braised sirloin tips simmered in dark beer with prunes. I always knew they'd find a use for prunes. <laughs> <laughs> and in Spain, their pulpo. That's uh, squid, you know. No, I didn't know. And now that I do, I wish I hadn't. <laughs> Bertie, allow me to congratulate you on this delicious ham. Well... I finally got past the Immigration Bureau. <laughs> mm, perfectly delicious. And from what foreign country does this exotic dish come? The South. South of France? South of Alabama. <laughs> I guess that will hold you. Bertie, your coffee is especially good. I think I'm going to be sorry I mentioned coffee. You haven't lived till you've tasted coffee in Europe. Huh? I'm sorry I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Judge Hooker, you should be elected president of the European Chamber of Commerce. Whoop. Hey, Leroy. Well, Hunk, I didn't say it. I just said... You never mind, never mind. Why don't we change the subject for a change? All righty, all righty. I'll tell you about some of the sights that I saw abroad. Hey, we've heard about it already. Did you see the Leaning Tower of Pizza? Pizza. Not pizza, Leroy. Pizza is something they eat in Italy. Well, maybe if they stopped eating on it, it wouldn't lean. <laughs> <laughs> well, right here in America, Horace, we've got the upright tower of the Empire State Building. You don't get the idea, Gelde. I mean, for instance, the lowlands of Holland. Yeah, well, we've got Death Valley, and that's as low as you can get. <laughs> then there's the famous Eiffel Tower. That's known all over the world. The Statue of Liberty's not exactly a stranger, you know. Gee, Unc, I think it'd be keen to see the seven wonders of the world. Leroy, why go to Europe? <laughs> We've got the eighth wonder right here in Bertie. Why, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Gentlemen, we've now come to dessert. And if you prefer crepes, Suzette, or Zabaloni, I'll throw my apple pie and dowdy out of the kitchen window. Why, Bertie... <laughs> I didn't mean to make you mad. I'm not mad. I'm just boiling like Mount Vesuvius. Yeah, Bertie, don't forget we've got a volcano, Mount Lassen. Oh, uh oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. I should have used a local product. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I've learned so much about Europe and America. At dinner, I'll need bicarbonate to digest it all. And I've learned about Europe, too. The main thing is they can keep it. <laughs> keep it. I hate to make these comparisons, for after all, I am an American. Well, I'm glad you finally remembered it. Of course, Gildy. I understand why you've been making these loyal and patriotic comparisons. You have your position to maintain. Yeah, well, just the same. I... Position? Yes, as the new president of the Chamber of Commerce. You Horace, how'd you find that out? Oh, I have my spies. Tried to keep it from me, didn't you? No, Judge. Skullduggery has been going on behind my back. Yeah, but Horace... I can understand... I really can't. When they could have had me, why would they pick you? Yeah, I'll tell you why. The American Constitution says no foreigner can be president of the United States. And that goes for the Chamber of Commerce, too. <laughs> Gildy will be back in just a moment. You made a little remark to a friend one day, and it got passed around. By the time it reached the authorities, it had been twisted and changed, so that it wasn't your statement anymore. But that didn't make any difference. You were hauled into the prison, forced to sign a confession that you couldn't even read, and found guilty of uttering poisonous and dangerous remarks. The verdict? Guilty. The sentence? Ten years at hard labor. But what about the right of free speech, you say? Yes, that's exactly why such a thing could not happen to you. 
but it is happening in some countries today. The difference between these countries and yours is that you are guaranteed the right to free speech. Now get that word guaranteed. You're not allowed, not permitted, but guaranteed the right to say what you want, where you want, any time you want. It's in the first article of your Bill of Rights. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The lecture halls and the auditorium, the soapbox in the park, the conversations among friends, well, they're all examples of free speech. They had their birth in the town meetings of our ancestors. They'll still be there for our children and for future generations. No one can take it away from us or from them. No one can make a law against free speech. It's guaranteed to us, permanently. It's one of our freedoms. Oh, I don't know, Peavy. We were pretty hard on the judge. But personally, I'm surprised they let him re-enter the country. Uh-oh. Here comes Benedict Arnold now. Yeah. Hello, Judge. Greetings, fellow jolly boys. Yeah, hello, Horace. Gildy, I'm glad I found you. I want to tell you that I am accepting the kind offer of the Chamber of Commerce to be their guest speaker. Well, that's fine. As long as they haven't invited you yet. Gildy, I've been thinking. When I arrived, my secretary, Miss Matterhorn, met me. And when she drove me home, I found she'd stocked my larder with all necessary groceries. My neighbor down the block brought me in some cookies. And the neighbor next door brought in some late chrysanthemum. Gildy, Americans are a very warm and hospitable people. I've been made to feel very welcome and at home. Well, that's good as long as you live here. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that warmed me, I've had the first hot bath since I went abroad. <laughs> From where did you take? I think he means it. Well, Judge, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> May I ask what you're going to speak about to the Chamber of Commerce? Yelda, my speech will be See America First. Well, you nice old goat. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> Great Gildersleeve is played by Willard Waterman and is produced and directed by Virgil Reimer. Musical compositions by Jack Meekin. Included in the cast were Walter Tetley, Amanda Randolph, Earl Ross, and Dick Legrand. This is Don Rickles inviting you to listen again next week to another new adventure of The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week, at this same time and over this same station, listen to Willard Waterman as The Great Gildersleeve. The Great Gildersleeve has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Watch other episodes of The Great Gildersleeve every Thursday night right here on Golden Age Radio. All new episodes every Thursday, starting June 13th, 2024. Enjoying the timeless classics on Golden Age Radio? If you're loving the nostalgia and captivating stories, consider supporting our channel with a tip. Your generosity helps us continue bringing you the best of vintage radio entertainment. Simply click on the link in the description. Thank you for being part of our community. Lost in Brazil invites you on an unforgettable journey where every moment is an adventure waiting to be discovered. Join us as we uncover the soul of Brazil, one incredible experience at a time. Click on the link in the description and embark on the ultimate Brazilian odyssey. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old-time radio programs. 
Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.